Well, good afternoon, investors. Welcome to our October 15th. We are two weeks out from Halloween and our our best small companies for 2025 moment. And uh, we'll have information out on that within the next day or so. We will be doing a special Saturday program. My name is Mark Robertson. I am joined here by my dear colleague from a few miles to the north. Uh, later on in the session, we're going to describe how I'm in the future. I'm going to be able to fly and land on the deck at his house. <laughs> Ken, Ken Kavula. It, it is a nice sized new deck. It really <laughs> is. I don't. Maybe one of those vertical planes can land on it, Mark. I don't know. It's a well, good sized deck, though. Well, be, hello be, everybody. Glad to be here. Betsy's going to fix me up, so we'll, we'll it'll be just fine. <laughs> we also have special guests, Matt Spielman, in the back room. How how's Houston today, Matt? Very good. We're looking forward to a, a cold spell, uh, highs in the 80s and lows in the 50s uh, tomorrow. Oh, right. So one last day of summer. You're you're aware that we're looking at 30 degrees uh, within the next few days here. I have my, have... my mom is visiting, visiting from Minnesota and brought entirely inappropriate outerwear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And last but not least, certainly not least, we have a very special guest with us here today, Betsy Wills. She is an avid investor from the Colorado area. Good afternoon, Betsy. Good afternoon, Mark and Ken and Matt. Thank you for having me. I was uh, uh, looking at your display here and I appreciated um, your uh, giving tribute to the Rocky Mountains. Um, Absolutely. And yeah, and beautiful shot. I was just glad you didn't include the uh, shot of the... Um, the folks that got stuck in that gold mine elevator uh, last week. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> no, we don't. I, we probably don't want to go there yet. Is everybody okay? Or yeah, there yeah. Were, one person died, um, but apparently it wasn't related. Um, and there was plenty okay. of the people that were stuck underground for seven or eight hours. Had um, you know, uh, were safe. Uh, had plenty of air and whatever, and they got them up within seven or eight hours. I don't really know how they got them up. If the elevator wasn't working, they must have gotten it working. Well, but, I, um, well, let's hope for the yeah. best for all of them. As you can see here, we are we are advocating a different type of uh, discovery of gold with the streams and uh, um, maybe a little bit easier approach to it. Well, good stuff. We're going we are going to talk about stocking small companies. Ken is going to finish his two part series, summarizing his philosophies on small company investing, and then we will check in just briefly on the value line stock to buy their monthly feature and the utility bill auto pay. But we do have a lot of ground to cover, so let's go ahead and roll, Ken, if you're ready. Sounds real good. Uh, we have Kevin in the back room with us as well. So if oh. you hear a fifth voice, that'll be Kevin's voice. Uh, glad you're with us, Kevin, uh, and thank you for the information uh, that you sent me this morning. I appreciate it. Great. Sorry it took me so long to get it to you, but uh, I'm going to try to be really quiet back here, so this will hopefully be the last you hear of me. Okay. Well, we are going to mention you later on in the program. No promises, Kevin. though. <laughs> oh, we're very much aware of that. All right, here's our weekly reminder that Portillo's is not a sponsor of the session, although they should be. And I do have to get my hands on a copy of that Seeking Alpha program. And Betsy did advise me that she did not partake of Portillo's during the recent national convention in Chicago. Uh, something yeah. about hot dogs not agreeing with her. And I just want everybody to know that you can go to the menu online and they've got so much more than hot dogs. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep that in mind next time. <laughs> I, I see it's no longer near 14, though, Mark. It's, uh, you know, what's going on here? Well, it's bouncing off my class basis. Okay. Right. It continues to bounce in the wrong direction, so we'll keep cheering for it. All right, here is our weekly reminder in honor of Betsy, as you will discover, she is a, a legal entity with the SEC. I made the no investment recommendation is intended even bigger for her today. And she she can she she could definitely sanction those are important words in a presentation Why? like this. I fought the law and the law won. <laughs> that song? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Everything we do here is about education, but um, more appropriately, it's about the sharing of discoveries and uh, basically sharing amongst a, a bunch of friends that are familiar with the Modern Investment Club movement. We've been doing this, not personally, but the movement has been out there for eight decades. And we just love to describe how we find opportunities 
and how we basically analyze those opportunities and deploy them in either our personal or club portfolios. You are absolutely expected to do your own review and make your own decision when it comes to make in any investment decision. If we hold something, we will try to remember to disclose it, but it is up to you, whether it's investing related resources or specific investments, make your own decisions. Our two email addresses are there at the bottom if you want copies of the slides or if you have follow-up questions or suggestions for future topics. All good, Ken? All good, Mark. Let's keep going. All right, quick look at the market. The market has continued to rally as it has through uh, the second half of September and into the first several days of October. Uh, the average return forecast, whether you're looking at value line or our um, manifest investing projected returns or the projected returns on value, they're all in that basically 9% range right now. And uh, this is where we have to towel off Ken a little bit again. He, we're gonna, Ken's gonna have a really up and down day here this afternoon. Uh, the banks apparently are coming in pretty strong. And Matt's been giving us reports on all the banks. Western Alliance, I believe, is, did I hear $92 a share? Yeah, I, I think the term you're looking for is En Fuego. En Fuego. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not an all-time high mark. The That Western Alliance hit those kind of prices, but it's been quite a while since it hit those prices. So I'm very happy to see it back where it is, especially when when a lot of us were buying shares down in the high teens and low twenties. So very happy. Good stuff. And, and Kevin, I do still hold my shares of Western Alliance. So you're determined to get me to the to, uh, You're baiting me. I have to talk. <laughs> you, back to you. You can't help yourself. All right. So basically the market is relatively fairly priced. That doesn't mean there aren't some opportunities out there. And of course we are on the hunt for them. Quick look at our performance perspectives. Again, the 10 most widely followed stocks by our subscribers are the company names that are shown here and they continue to shine. And uh, we did switch back to a 10 year look back period. Uh, everything's pretty much the, the same as it was. I did inject the Russell 2000 growth into this week's listing instead of just a regular small caps. And just the reason for doing that is we've talk, talked about it quite a bit and it's just uh, one more way to uh, emphasize that these have been kind of in the toilet for a while. They got red hot last October, then they, they cooled off. This number typically leads this group of index type investing. And you can see that it's, it's dropped off quite a bit over the last 10 years, a lot of that within the last two or three years. So we believe that there is coiled spring pent up opportunity there to be discovered. And just to make a further point about that, here's the list that we have showed a few times, just the raw potential of going through something like the Russell 2000 growth ETF, that's the BTWG ticker symbol for the ETF. And this one passes the Kabula test, right? Yeah. It does, do. Mark. Okay. I can recognize and I own some of the stocks on this list. Therefore, I will read the entire list. Okay. <laughs> and what's fascinating is this goes back to last Halloween when we were doing this same exercise. And Ken applies a very stringent filter. He's a simple man. He says, I just simply want to see some earnings. <laughs> You know, he wants to see some current year earnings. And so we looked at just those, and then I'll leave it up to the rest of you to look at the numbers achieved on the right-hand side there for a total return since last Halloween. So again, what this stands on a Rocky Mountain somewhere near Betsy's house and says there's gotta be opportunity in that that field of opportunity. Good stuff. No. Now, Mark, you you mentioned last year. This is a these are re, this is recent data. However, we're looking at right now, right? This is since last October. Yep. Okay. So, but I mean that's uh, October. Okay. All right. And these are these are current numbers for the relative strength right. index and everything else. Right. All right. So let's take a quick time out to talk about the groundhog. Um, Jim Gallagher, of course, is still holding down the number one position. Um. I did inject myself in here pointing out that I have moved in to the second 40. 
So that that's good news, I hope. But uh, what are your thoughts here, Ken? Well, three of the wolves are with us today at the at this uh, webinar, Mark. So I want to point out number 21 on the list, folks. Uh, we made the list and we made it in good fashion. Uh, we're up there. Uh, we're not competing for a, a top spot, but that's an extremely respectable 27% uh, total return gain uh, since Groundhog Day. And uh, I don't like that you're two tenths of a percent above my own portfolio but other than that we're in in pretty decent shape and uh the janet blazer index is on full display here and, and don sheets by the way is up to number 10 one of our local investing advocates don is a wolf also yes there you go so ken advises me that that is near an all-time record for the number of group or club entries in the it's top 40 tied. It's the tied. top 40, we have 14, Mark, and that ties the all-time. Uh, it's 15, but that's a number 41. Mark Mark pushed them onto the list there just to be able to show we had 15 clubs there. But uh, Alchemy, we're rooting for you to move up a couple of spots and the rest of the clubs stay where you are, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I like that club out of New York also. Well, and as you can see, I, I injected uh, a look at this. This is from Twitter. Uh, gentleman basically describing the hottest stocks for the last year, the top 15 growth stocks, and Jim Gallagher's ASTS is right here. That is what has propelled Jim to where he's at up here. And uh, uh, what I found interesting, and I'm going to blow it up here on the next page, is a number of these stocks either appeared in Groundhog portfolios or were part of active discussions over within the last year. And uh, almost all of them, and most of those are actually in Groundhog portfolios. I guess we should probably do, be doing even better than we are. We're doing very well, but uh, some interesting names there. I'm I'm kind of curious about this one. That's a new ticker to me, Ken. E O S E. There's Anybody there's two or three new tickers on here for me, Mark. So I'm gonna take this list and run them through my filters and see what they look like. Uh, uh, they all have earnings, folks. That's a really good thing. Well, that's cool. Carvana, of course, was an absolute train wreck a year ago, so it would have been really tough to to go after that one. Or there were a number of questions as to whether or not they would remain in business a year ago. So they've they've done quite well. So again, it's just kind of neat to this. watch. This hymn's really got some good news a couple of days ago, Mark. Uh, about a week and a half ago, the FDA said that they couldn't do their uh, weight loss drug anymore. Uh, they couldn't send it out in, in a, uh, a, a mixed form that wasn't using the same kind of a injector that Monjaro was using or that Ozempic was using. Uh, and they, the FDA's kind of backed itself off and now, and they said that, that this firm and a couple of other firms can continue to offer these uh, weight loss drugs. And they come in vials and you have to use a, an older type hypodermic to take the drug out of oh, the vial and you have to mm. measure it. But, but they got good news, and, and that's what's propelled a lot of this growth in this, this hymns right here uh, in the last four or five months at least. And this one here for everybody out there, this one has appeared. This is the tennis shoe and sporting apparel company that has appeared a number of times at some of our, our panel sessions, and it's, it's worth taking a look at also. All right. Just a couple right, just, moments. Just to clarify before you get in trouble, Mark, EOSE does not have a blue line. They do not. DKTX does not have a green line. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. So, well, I, I misspoke. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let Ken off with that one. He was he's, he's still kind of, he's still kind of giddy over all the bank results. Um, here's a quick look at the, Value Line has been doing a, a monthly broadcast on YouTube. One stock to buy right now, and. Uh, They've been doing pretty well, and this is just a summary just to show you some of the stuff they've gotten into. You can just go to YouTube and search on that title. You will find their sessions, and uh, they walk through all the tools and a discussion of the companies. And some of you may recall, approximately six months ago, we looked at this table, and we were a little bit concerned about the single digits we were seeing all through here. And I don't know if they listened to us or not, but 
I want you to notice those top six have a higher growth forecast, and I would argue that their results have actually done um, quite a bit better here over the last six months, so that at least they're giving themselves a fighting chance. So kind of interesting. I do find it interesting that these two numbers line up in perfect sync. Anything jump off the page for you, Ken? Well, yeah, this uh, Novo Nordisk, uh, uh, I guess I want to point out that when you're looking at relative return or annualized return for a very short period of time, those numbers can jump in both directions uh, mm. really widely. And uh, near the top of the list, we're looking at at maybe four month returns, five month returns, six month returns on on those stocks. And I, I wouldn't put a lot of uh, juice behind the the red or the green at the top of that list. You need to give it a little bit of time to start to perform. Uh, I am not really impressed with the bottom of the list where they've had time to perform, but that's neither here nor there, I guess. Well, they are chunking away at a, a fairly decent overall number, so we'll see how they do. We'll certainly check. Now, you and I have them. both. You and I have talked uh, occasionally, Mark, about United Rentals and how we just can't uh, bring ourselves to pull the trigger on it. No, how many, no matter how many times it appears on one of our lists, and United Rentals certainly has been the the star performer uh, for anything in the past year or so, discounting some of the numbers near the very top up here. Yeah, that's 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 one of my more annoying stocks. Every time I go through the mental exercise, Pat Donnelly picked it at the convention. It shows up here. I've I've been through this three or four times. About the time I pull the trigger, uh, catastrophe will happen. So, so somehow they know. They are wired to know that it's in Mark's portfolio and time to misbehave. All right. Here's a quick look at our utility reserve. And again, for those of the, this may be new to you, we basically are answering the question here. Can you take $45,000 invested into a basket of stocks? We started with five high quality utilities uh, back about three and a half years ago and make it so that you auto pay the monthly electric bill and do it forever. And this is the current portfolio. You can see that the $45,000 invested even after paying all of the utility bills for three and a half years is checking in at $56,000. So that's kind of cool. And uh, fairly recently, we made the decision that it didn't have to be just utilities. So we picked some, you know, a little bit higher yield stocks to put in there. And we replaced one of the utilities or the pieces of one utility with those two uh, positions. I, I would point out, Mark, that JEPI, uh, the J.P. Morgan Equity Premium Income Fund, uh, JEPI is being actively advertised uh, on CNBC right now. Quite a you, you see you see it popping up on ads on a very frequent basis. So this is evidently becoming an extremely popular instrument for people to use, either to store cash or or to generate cash. Either one. Yeah, and for those of you that are trad traditional investment club people out there, you're wondering what in the heck are we doing here? Uh, we well, we were forced to sell one of our utilities because some other utility bought it. So we that's how we ended up with this fourteen thousand dollars that you see here in cash. We decided to invest that into Jeppy to learn together. Uh, again, learning as a group what this Jeppy thing is all about. The nutshell version of it is that it's a J.P. Morgan ETF, exchange-traded fund, that is invested in 40 or 50 of the bluest blue-chip companies you can imagine. And they're basically doing a, a form of covered call and some option-type stuff to augment the dividend income. And we'll take a look at that in the next slide. So we're, we're basically looking over their shoulders, seeing how this works for us. I will say that my wife and I do use this in our um, cash equivalent portion of our our personal investing, so we have been convinced that it's uh, robust enough to be uh, attractive for us. Here is a look at the ledger, and this again, this is the magic page. We want to stay above zero on the right hand column, and you can see all of the transactions. You can see the monthly utility payments, and then you can also see those Jeppy dividends. They're not the same every month. They pay a monthly dividend, 
but depending on how the options and covered calls do and all that stuff, um, the number varies from month to month. But you can see what the actuals have been, and anything below the red line is budget, and that includes a budget to make a tax payment of approximately $400 net come April. So, Ken, uh, any, any thoughts on this? I mean, I continue to really like the demonstration mode here. I I do as well, Mark, and I'm I'm wondering. Uh, I've been asked this question now by three or four different people uh, over the last six months or so, and and they're wondering if they could do some kind of a demonstration like this to pay a mortgage payment, and except for the numbers probably being larger, uh, you know, your the the payments are are probably more for a mortgage than they would be for an electric gas bill. Uh, I don't see any reason why you couldn't pull a portfolio together and then use it to fund a mortgage payment. Uh, I think it's it's perfectly doable. Uh, it might take a little bit more effort to identify the beginning companies that you're going to use, but I do think it can be done, don't you? I absolutely do, and I would just say stay tuned. We've actually been kind of mandated to take a look at that. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump into our best small companies, our quest for 2025 come Halloween, actually the Saturday morning after Halloween, we will be making our selections. And uh, just a quick reminder that small cap does not necessarily mean small company. So with that, Ken, you are good to go with part two. Well, I presented part one in August uh, at a ticker talk. Here's part two that I presented in September at a ticker talk. And I'm speaking now to a better investing off, uh, audience. And that means that I've, I've kind of left Manifest uh, out of the presentation, but I want everybody to understand that Manifest is one of my primary sources and everything I say today uh, should include Manifest on top of the other things that I'm talking about. Uh, give me a click if you would, Mark. Uh, you saw this last uh, week. Uh, we just uh, always are hearing from our members, where do you find these small companies? And more importantly, how the heck do you study them when there's not even a value line available? What do you use to make your judgments? I think we're going to get into that a little bit more later on in the poll session today. But let me tell you about some things that you should never neglect as far as I'm concerned. First of all, keep it simple. And you saw this slide last week as well. Uh, demand from your small companies the same things that you demand from your larger companies, especially when you're beginning to study smaller companies. Look for consistent growth, and that uh, comes up with up straight and parallel lines on an SSG. Look for a blue line, that means they have profits, and demand enough history so that some kind uh, of a uh, of a growth pattern can be established. Uh, for a small company, it might only be two or three or four years, but demand a little bit of history. If you're going backwards and looking at companies with no blue line or companies that have just become public, uh, then uh, you need to identify that as, as not necessarily good solid growth company investing even a lot of things we'll do with small companies kind of strain the envelope just a little bit but we want those small companies in our portfolio for the growth that they can give us for the outstanding growth many times that they can give it uh, i want you to ignore choppy growth i know in a larger company when we look at 10 data points if the growth is really choppy we want to know why but i want you to ignore choppy growth that went on four or five years ago in a small company uh think of it as as water over the dam and kind of forget about it Focus on the most recent two or three or four years uh, and focus on the fundamentals. Try to keep the story about the stock secondary to what's happening. There's all kinds of great stories out there, but the managers of a lot of these story companies can't turn the story 
into profit. Uh, we're talking about companies that have at least a billion dollars or less in sales. And Mark and I have begun to define smaller companies as maybe two or even three billion in sales in the most recent fiscal year. That's keeping track with where the average small company is being defined by the market. When we look at micro cap uh, funds or micro capped exchange traded funds, we notice that they might have as much as two and a half or three billion in revenues. And that shouldn't stop us from looking at them as a small company. Uh, I'm looking for sales growth in double digits and earnings growth to at least match that. And double digits means double digits. It means 10% or better. Uh, earnings follow sales and stock price follow earnings. Uh, a simpler way to say this is to say everything begins with sales. So you want a really strong sales line and then you want some earnings. If you have those two things happening, the stock price will follow providing the management is of a high enough quality to make it all fit together. Next slide, please. Here's a, an SSG from the SSG Plus provided to better investing members. Uh, and if this data that I've circled is available, for heaven's sakes, will you use it? Uh, if you press in the legend, the last two buttons, you get sales detail estimates and EPS detail estimates, and they'll appear right on your graph. And for many of the companies in the database, including many of the smaller companies, you'll also get a two-year and a five-year Morningstar estimate. These are not the correct answers provided by Better Investing. Better Investing doesn't provide, quote, correct answers unquote, for your SSG. These are just one data source telling us what their views are. Uh, two years in sales, long term, meaning five years in earnings. If the data is there, use it as part of your study. Next slide, Mark. Also, check this new tab in the SSG Plus called Sentiment, because that tab many times will just verify the fact that if you're studying a small company that looks really good, maybe there's a large number of folks in the community that are also studying that company. Uh, do a click mark if you would. Here's the sentiment tab that I've clicked. Notice it's green up near the top up there. And we're looking at sales right now. And I've circled how many studies are being looked at less let's politely call them outliers. Uh, we get some uh, SSGs uh, into the SSG Plus that are really out there. I mean really out there. And the program tries to eliminate things that are too far out of the ordinary and calls them outliers. There's 140 studies, however, on this particular company, which is EXLS. There's 140 studies, and I think that's enough for you to at least look at the projections, look at the graph, the histogram, notice that the preponderance of folks are picking the sales growth somewhere between 10.8 and 11.8, and take that into consideration as you do your study. The more data you can get, the better off you are. Beware, however, if the total number of studies is less than 50 or 60. If that total number gets down to 10 or 15, don't use those numbers, folks. Look at the historical trends and don't be afraid to look at shorter term trends and longer term trends. Here's a 10 year trend at the top. And if you knock off the oldest five years, you get five year trends. And lo and behold, the computer automatically uh, requotes what those trends happen to be, recalculates them for you. Use them as data sources. A company won't always repeat history, but I will tell you, my experience says that a good company will seldom move past 
their long-term trends when it comes to sales and earnings. They might duplicate them, but they will seldom move past them. And if they do, it's going to be done quite slowly. Here's an example of this trend improving the five years better than the 10 year, but it improved ever so slowly over those five years. It wasn't rapid. It wasn't something that was going to happen overnight. Next slide. I love the research tool. If you go down to analyst estimates, uh, I'm showing you how you can use one of these sources. There's all kinds of free sources on this tab. You might as well use them if they're available. In Yahoo, you go directly to this page, revenue estimates, and you see a percentage growth for the current year and for the next year. And then if you scroll way, way, way to the bottom, it says growth estimates. Folks, I'm going to assure you that's EPS growth estimates, even though it doesn't say EPS. And here you get a next year, current year, and a next five years numbers. You got four or five of these data sources in the tool. Why not use a couple of them and grab some numbers there? They almost always will give you a number, even if there's no value line to look at. You can still gather some data. Next slide, please. Here I am looking at an extended value line. And many of you uh, write me and tell me that all you can find is an extended value line and it doesn't give you anything new. Well, in fact, many times, even though it's pure data on an extended value line, many times value line will give you a couple of projections. Notice those dark black numbers that I've circled up there and notice that they're in the future. Therefore, the year 2024, which we're in, and therefore the year 2025. Now, there's an NA not available for 26, but at least you're getting some projections. For example, at least I'm seeing that value line is looking for PE values, the average PE to compress, to move downward, to get smaller. It goes from 27.8 to 26.3 to 22.7. That's useful information. As you do your judgments, maybe you should include some of that information as you try to figure out what's an appropriate high average PE for the next five years and what's an appropriate low average PE for the next five years. Next slide, please, Mark. Don't be afraid to use your broker. I noticed that the newest Better Investing magazine has a nice big article about using your broker. There's always all kinds of stuff available, especially from the larger brokers. All of it's usually free if you have an account, and some of it is actually valuable. What I find even more valuable, however, is a visit to the library and a talk with their business librarian. Now, if you're in a library without a business librarian, don't ignore the main librarian who's there because she or he probably has some information that will help you. I was amazed at all the different databases that I could access electronically from home right from our library system, and that included Value Line and Morningstar and CFRA. I could get them right from our library with no pain, uh, nothing except a library card and the number on that card. They're treasured resources, and you're probably paying some kind of a small tax to support that library. Why not use it? Next slide. Uh, you're looking for high quality small growth companies. Let me say that again, high quality. So if you're a Manifest subscriber, and I know most of you at this session are, 
then look for quality numbers at 80 plus. And don't forget, Manifest gives us a five-year sales growth number. And Manifest gives us an average PE number. Now, these are not just numbers that Mark pulls out of the air. These are numbers that are coming from another data source. It happens to be one called Y charts. If the number's there, why not use it? And watch when those numbers change. For a small company, folks, review your SSG more often than you might do it for a well-behaved, large, blue-chip company. Maybe you want to rethink that SSG three or four times a year instead of once or twice a year. And folks, resist the urge to get stubborn and hold on to a small company even when the idea sours. Don't be afraid to kick it to the curb. Sometimes small companies just don't work out. It's all involved with management. And sometimes, even though the managers are the founders of the company and they had a great idea, they don't have very many ideas on how to turn that great idea into profit. Get rid of a small company when you hit a major roadblock. That's all. Uh, I think it's common sense, and I'd be glad to engage you in a conversation. You have my email address. Drop me a question if you have one. Thanks, Ken. Good reinforcement of a, a number of things to think about and uh, when it comes to the realm of small company investing. All right, we're going to go ahead and launch into our weekly small company quest and uh, just do a couple of things first of all our weekly stop in at the screener no new changes here just a quick reminder maybe a bit of a tease that i sure i'm pretty sure we're going to be looking at some of the smaller banks faster growing banks in the next week or two this but is a just, really interesting one, Mark. Yeah, uh, all geez. of you out there, if you have a chance to begin to look at TBBK, take a look at it. Really interesting. We're going to be taking a look at that one for sure, along with a few others. And with that, we want to honor one of our traditions, and that's to look to our friends out there in the investing community that, that do the small company stuff. And we have a real treasure for you here this afternoon. Betsy Wills, good afternoon, Betsy. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Mark. So... Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I um, appreciate being invited to this um, August presence. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about some small stocks that have captured my attention. Uh, but And I know that um, Mark uh, gave you a disclaimer at the beginning of the session, but I have a couple more I want to give you too um, that are pretty standard for our Rocky Mountain Chapter Model Club. Um, by the way, the Model Club uh, next meeting, I think it's the next slide, is on the 23rd. <clears throat> we have a brief business meeting uh, at 6.45. It starts, that's Denver time. Um, and then we go into uh, a, a, a brief educational presentation and then a stock study. Uh, coming up, we have a presentation from Joan Loken, who's a well-known name in the better investing community. Uh, and always has a, a great insights. And she's going to be doing a presentation on beta. And then the stock study is one I haven't, fam I'm not familiar with. Maybe you guys are. It's called Qualys, Q U A L Y S. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, but it's it deals with cloud security and compliance. So um, <clears throat> that's what we do at the Rocky Mountain Chapter Model Club. We're focused on small and mid cap stocks. So, um, I, so I sent this chart to Mark because um, although Jeff Bezos, he's a guy that needs no introduction here, but um, I, it doesn't really, I mean, doesn't say that these quotes are pertaining to small stocks, but they certainly do. Uh, given a 10% chance of 100 times payoff, you could take that bet every time. And we know that it's easier for a small stock to go from $10 to $20 than it is to go from 100 to 200. And he's commented on several occasions that he makes his investments based on if it's going to change people's lives. That's actually um, kind of where I come from when I look for a stock to present and to talk about, uh, which leads me again into my a couple of disclaimers. So. 
Um, Better Investing always says that the SSG provides you with 80% of what you need to know about a company, and the other 20% is your own research. Well, with small stocks, it's just the opposite with small companies. The SSG Amen. only provides you with 20% maybe of what you need to know, and the other 80% is your research. Interesting. You'll see that, you'll see that today uh, in some of the stocks I'm going to talk about. Um, so the second uh, thing I want to say is the kind of the companies I will be talking about today. Some are profitable, some are not. Um, but uh, you'll know that if I list that if you've listened to my stock presentations, you know that I'm looking for companies with a new idea, something can change things, or a developing moat. Uh, so very much akin to Jeff Bezos' philosophy. Um, and uh, third is when I started my this investment club that's still going in 1999, um, I told the, the ladies that joined that um, this is uh, not your rent money. Uh, do not put your rent money in mm. the club. So uh, for our club, uh, it's, we just passed our 25 year mark. We just passed um, 600,000 in assets. Nice. So, so um, the first company I'd like to talk about, well, some of, the, some of these companies I'm going to be talking about, I mentioned at Bink. Um, the two of them are on Mark's chart here. Uh, intuitive Machines, Lunar, Powell, POWL, uh, Rocket Lab, and then there's going to be a couple more that we'll talk about briefly. So um, first up, I think on your slide deck, Mark, is the Intuitive Machines. It is. Um, okay, so as I said right. at Bink, there's a lot of information on this chart. So if you could just kind of um, look away from the screen for a little bit and and because I'm going to tell you about Lunar and then we can look at some of the, the graphics. But <clears throat> if, if you're a Star Trek fan, if you're a, you know, a rocket fan, which I am, we'll see another cop in a company today about that deals with rockets. But um, this is the closest you're going to get to the final frontier. Um, these guys, you might have heard earlier this year, they successfully landed a rover on the South Pole of the moon. They were within 10 degrees of the South Pole. It was operational for 147 hours, and they had only planned for operations for 144. Um, the, so the project ended, but while it was, uh, you know, while it was uh, there, it uh, transmitted important data uh, and so on that they had. Now, the Chinese found, the Chinese tried this and they didn't do it. So this is a small company that actually sent a rocket and landed on the moon. They intend to build a regular lunar mission timetable um, and they're going to sell space aboard their rockets. And they buy their rockets, coincidentally, from uh, SpaceX. So you can't invest in SpaceX, but you can invest here in lunar. And they plan to do both Earth and Moon orbital delivery, as well as delivery to the Moon surface. So it's a new industry, potential new industry, and so some care is needed when you're looking at the size of this market. But they do intend to act as a safe de a space delivery service through their version of a rideshare, which is an interesting <laughs> uh, kind of play on, uh, yeah, on Uber. Um, they, they want to be a leader in the data transmission services and, of course, ultimately for uh, living and working in space. They, um, year over year, their revenues um, did increase. Uh, they're, again, we're only talking very small companies, so 41 million uh, revenues in the second quarter of 24 as compared to 18 million revenues in the second quarter of 23. Um, they uh, have uh, $31 million in cash, on, which doesn't sound like a lot for what they're doing, but um, they just received a, uh, a new contract from NASA for uh, developing what they call this uh, near, near space network. And it will be uh, a five-year contract with an additional five-year options. And uh, it's the first step in commercializing lunar activities by creating a geostationary satellite communications network in the space region. And it's one of the uh, many components that are comprising NASA's Artemis campaign, which will ultimately uh, is, get, is intended to establish a greater presence on the moon. And by the way, their second um, 
their second launch is planned for um, between now and the end of the year. Uh, it's uh, sold out. <laughs> so the ride share is fully sold out. Uh, the landing site I thought was kind of interesting. It's near the Shackleton um, connecting ridge on the moon's south pole. Uh, and it will have a lander and a Japanese rover and then a NASA laser tool uh, involved with it. Hmm. So um, again, uh, we're not um, uh, not profitable yet, but uh, we got some revenues, which, you know, so you have a blue line. Uh, and then, Mark, I don't know if you want to talk really about this, but it's just broken up, um, the CSSG broken up into various components, right? Right. You know, you know, you're basically looking at a company that a value line at least believes it has a fair value of a little over 10. They're trading at just under eight. Um, obviously, very early stage. We should give all the disclaimers, but they are, uh, again, this kind of uh, fits very well into that launch pad, and no pun intended, well, launch pad investing of a company that is just breaking through and becoming profitable. And we probably should have some type of a cardiac monitor on Ken as we go forward here the, with the next <laughs> few slides, but um, I think you'll be all right. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so Mark, Mark, you referenced value line, but I think you meant Morning Stars for value, right? Yes, Morning Stars for value. Sorry about that. All right, the next right, company. Well, I find this. Are you are you through with this one? Or yep, you... done with that one. We'll move on to Powell again. I, I mentioned this also at Bank. Um, I think uh, Ken can take a deep breath on this one. He'll be okay. Um, He'll be okay with this one. <laughs> He'll be okay with this one. Uh, so you can see that's pretty dramatic right there. Look at the run up in price. Um, so uh, revenues uh, surged by 50% in the third quarter year over year, um, about uh, uh, third quarter. So it'd be Q3 23 to Q3 uh, 24. Um, they are a number one, uh, according to Seeking Alpha, in the electrical components and equipment stocks industry, and also number one in their industrial sector. And they are experts in electrical distribution. And what they do is they make various forms of customized switchware for commercial applications. So they're custom engineered, and they're in the solar, the wind, uh, fossil fuels, hydroelectric, and nuclear, all these industries. And recently, my club actually bought this company because we were looking for a way to get into the data center, um, with this um, surge in, in demand for data centers. Uh, one of the gals in my club was coming at it from a power, uh, a power supply uh, angle. Another one was looking at it from a kind of a construction side and constructing these big data centers, these things are huge. And, um, and Powell is, uh, is another one because they produce, um, they have power control room, substations, um, all kinds of control gear, circuit breakers, and all this other stuff. But it's uh, the only company really that is a high concentration and exposure to switch gear. And as you know, every, um, all these, different things need switches. Think of all the switches actually that are just in your house. Um, and then come, you know, think about one of these data centers or one of these other things. So um, as I said at Bank, uh, Powell sits smack in the middle of being of three of the largest mega trends right now. The transition towards clean energy. Uh, they are associated with renewable energy and the oil and gas industry is getting increasingly electrified, electrified and they cite the Permian Basin, what's going on down there. Um, uh, and this continued to grow at a rapid rate for at least a decade to come. And the revenues from its oil and gas segment were up about 56% in third quarter year over year. They're also in this artificial intelligence business, again, the data centers, um, uh, that the demand for those may single-handedly create a boom in the demand for electrical products. Uh, um, and the cloud data centers, uh, the computing demands, crypto mining operations, the charging stations uh, for buses, cars, and so on, uh, is all kind of encompassed within the second group. The third group is um, the growing trend to uh, what they call reshore, bring back manufacturing facilities to create local jobs and guarantee supply chains. 
and the Inflation Reduction Act, otherwise known as the CHIPT Act, uh, you know, provides incentives to do that. And of the announced projects that have been um, uh, in this area, only 18% of them has commenced building. Hmm. So 72% of these projects uh, remain in the planning stage. Um, takes mostly three to five years from the time of the start of the build before the electrical components are needed. So um, there's a significant shortage right now of transformers and switchgear throughout the United States, and that all these kind of all these mega trends should um, uh, provide a significant tailwind, provi uh, propelling uh, Powell's growth. And you know, if if Trump is elected uh, as president next month, uh, his policy of drill baby drill uh, is likely to significantly quicken uh, Powell Industries' speedy. Uh, rate of earnings growth. So if you want to go forward, Mark, uh, a slide, please. Uh, so mm -hmm. I did just run a quick SSG this morning. Uh, it, again, this is the only company we're going to look at this afternoon that has one, so I thought we ought to show it. Um, I did take some years out just to even out the growth. Um, I was fairly um, conservative with my forecasts on sales and earnings. Uh, as you can see, well below the um, the sales and EPS there that are the ACE analysts. And then if you go to the second page, um, you can see that um, it's, you know, that uh, I, I fuss with the SSG Plus because under the old toolkit, you used to be able to plug in your own forecast high price, but you can't do that on the SSG Plus. I'm looking at a double in five years, so I kind of just took the current price of 266 and uh, you know almost did a double uh, to get a 460 or 430 and then the PE you have to fiddle with the PE but I don't think I was too out of line maybe mm -hmm. on the PE but anyway I did get a um, I did get a buy and a little over a three to one which is what we like like to look for yeah and I'm, so, I'm kind of in go ahead Beck, Betsy no go ahead I was just going to say, Ken, I think we want to take just, just a moment to scratch our heads over this quality trend and what that may tell us, because look at how this thing is just kind of taken off, and it's obviously uh, businesses leveraged into, uh, as she said, some of the strongest mega trends out there, so just something to think about. Are you are you ready to... Uh... Yep, we'll go on to the next one. All right, we'll, okay, we'll... so Rocket Lab. Um, these guys do actually build rockets <laughs> and, you know, rocket development is hard and things do go wrong. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, they do have two lines of business. One is launching rockets and the second one is a space, uh, space, what they call space systems. So under their launching service, which I, which is really take it off. Sorry about the pun. Um, they provide custom launches. Uh, so you can launch on demand, uh, you can uh, tailor your orbit, you can have multiple launch sites, they have multiple sites around the country. Um, you can control the schedule of the launch and in the same launch, they can the rocket can go to different planes and altitudes. So if you need to deliver something to um, so many miles up, yeah, you can deliver that satellite there and then you can move the rocket and you can go up to another level and uh, deploy another satellite if that's what you're doing. Their rocket that they're currently using and have been using uh, for all their launches to date is called the Electron and they've been doing launches since 2017. And interestingly, their rocket, this Electron rocket, accounted for 64% of all non-SpaceX U.S. launches. Wow. So, you know, you, you can't invest in SpaceX again, but here's a company yes. that's, <laughs> you know, that you can invest in and that's, um, it's actually doing it. Um, they pulled in uh, 141 million in contract value. They're up 71% year over year uh, revenue increase um, from 2023. The revenue growth has been driven by the increase in launches and growth in their space systems. They have a backlog of over a million, uh, sorry, over a billion uh, dollars. And interestingly, what they do here is um, they um, recognize, they take the money in when they get a contract, uh, but they don't recognize it until it's actually launched, which I like. 
because they're not just you know recognizing it as being income until they've actually delivered on the product and i think that's um i like that um so the next rocket they've got on uh in currently in uh development is called the um what's it called the neutron rocket and it's a little bit behind schedule uh they thought they were going to launch it this year but uh, now it's been um, postponed to mid 2025 so that rocket will provide them with higher margins, um, a, a bigger addressable market, and bigger potential payloads. So that is Rocket Lab for your consideration. And Mark's um, underlined a couple of things there. Um, earlier when we were talking, Mark, you want to talk about that green circle you put around the EPS? Yeah, that's, that's there just for Ken. Now uh, that, that is positive earnings out uh, a little over a year from now, kind of turning this that he described a few minutes ago from NA into a number. Now it is just three analysts covering, but at least there's three analysts out there, Ken, that think these guys might have a profit in 2026. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go All through right. two, two more to further annoy Ken. Okay, um, quickly, I know we're running out of time. So we're good, um, we're good. the next Do one. You need. Okay, next one is called Toast. And um, so as you might imagine, it does have something to do with the restaurant industry. Yeah, in fact, it's a, a SaaS company, software, software as a service. It's a cloud-based digital technology platform for the restaurant, uh, restaurant industry. It serves United States, Ireland, and India presently. Um, their uh, system uh, combines uh, m many of the things that need you need to run a restaurant. Um, they have so wait list and reservations, uh, menu management, uh, independent prep stations, kitchen display sy systems, tips manager, inventory. Um, all those things can be. Uh, you can buy you know the basic whatever you want and then you can add on all these different other things to the platform and so this is kind of a throwback to the beardstown ladies i uh, had heard about this company and uh, i just kind of you know thought oh okay um that's interesting and i went over the bagel store i want to say this was a couple of months ago and when i was <clears throat> using my card to check out it said toast and so I asked the guy behind the counter, I said, do you like the system? He said, oh, we love it. He said, it's great. You know, we keep track of everything through it. And then we were at a restaurant and you know how they bring around the little digital reader now for your, for your credit card at the end. And it said toast. So I thought, well, heck, um, I, got, I better take a better look at this. So I did and I bought some, um, by the way, I own all these companies, so <laughs> in terms of uh, disclaimers. Um, Toast has um, estimated its total addressable market at a, about 110 billion. And right now they're in um, about 1% current penetration. Mm. And um, the company now has 120 uh, per 120,000 total locations in the network, which is up 26% from last year. They intend to move into um, other um, other areas as well um, internationally. So, um, they, and future expansion could include things like beauty salons, uh, real estate offices, gyms, pet supply stores, and so on. So, what makes this, I think, uh, maybe a good thing for you to take a look at and consider is. Obviously, they have a first mover advantage for combining all these things into one system. It's a unique, it's proprietary, and as sometimes is the case, their customer referrals are driving the business as much as uh, they are themselves. So here we have another, some more of those little graphs. Uh, Mark, if you want to talk about well, those. Again, sales in the right uh, trajectory for a company like this, kind of Portillo's-ish and a fairly brief record with earnings and expected earnings in 2025. So again, disclaimer, disclaimer, early stage company, but definitely in a bit of a launch mode. So very interesting. I'd, I'd be interested to compare this to Stone Co. <laughs> some of the other companies we've looked at over the years, but good stuff. And last but not least. Uh, Joby, okay. So Ken. <laughs> Uh, Just, Ken, uh, this is the one can, I can put can on my deck, right? Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> you could turn off now if you want. No. Um, so, <laughs> Joby, uh, 
aviation um, is in the air taxi business. And actually, I was looking at this as well um, several months ago, kind of just kind of thought, oh, that's interesting. And then I, I was watching um, one of the, the business news channels in the morning, which I generally turn on while I'm buzzing around doing stuff. And they had a guest on and the host said, well, do you have any recommendations for us? And the guy starts talking about Joby. And I went, what? <laughs> because it's not profitable, um, but it uh, it's really a, um, it, they're making progress towards commercializing um, these air taxis to go to the airport or wherever you wanna go. Um, so as you can see in the picture there, it's an interesting design. It's a six propeller uh, plane um, and <laughs> they also operate on four battery packs. So you've got the whole environmental thing going on as well. Now it recently uh, received 500 uh, million uh, from Toyota uh, to, um, to continue the development of their, their craft. They have, um, uh, they've also, the FAA has also accepted um, numerous test plans related to onboard equipment and structural materials and their operational control system has been through tests with uh, the FAA. They have one, uh, one prototype uh, now and they are in their second prototype uh, is currently in development and uh, well actually it began flying during the second quarter and they recently completed the production of a third one and the fourth is in the final assembly and the fifth is under construction. So they remain on track to produce one aircraft a month by the end of the year and then they hope to ramp up after that. So they also um, have an electrical vehicle takeoff and landing uh, which is a, a hydrogen electric um, propulsion system. And they recently conducted a 523 mile test flight. And that test flight um, went, uh, is designed to demonstrate the capability of going uh, between destinations like Baltimore and Boston, for example, or San Francisco and San Diego. In San Diego. Hmm. And they did that by converting one of their electric batteries uh, so that it could operate using hydrogen. And I know in our previous discussions, before the session started today, we were talking about hydrogen yeah. and how it hasn't been utilized as much uh, yet. And they they also, I thought this was interesting, they also demonstrated an autonomous capability for flying using the US Air Forces um, in an Air Force ac uh, exercise. And they went three, th almost 4,000 miles of autonomous flight between nine military bases and public airports across California and Nevada. It had a safety pilot, which monitored it, but it completed fully autonomous uh, taxi takeoff and landing at each location. So um, the risk, uh, well, the latent demand, and we don't know really what the demand for this product would be. Uh, and even if demand does um, come about, there, there's airport traffic con uh, congestion, there's infrastructure that would have to be taken care of. So there's a lot of bottlenecks that could potentially come about, but again, it's um, it's kind of one of those ideas that come about from the future. I mean, whoever thought we'd be Dick Tracy's <laughs> all talking to our watch, right? That's right. Well, well, Ken, this is the one I want to. You need to buy me one of these for Christmas so I can fly up for our bull sessions and land on <laughs> land on your deck. So okay, <laughs> get, get, get your order in. I think it would be fascinating. And and Ken, I also wanted to warn you that you can squint and stand on your head. You won't find revenues yet. So I don't see any, and I'm <laughs> I'm uh, I've. Uh, I've listened very carefully to the presentation, and I put a nice light line through the name. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll leave this you. to the more adventuresome folks in the group. Thank you so much, Betsy. This this is an Hello. this is interesting, and this is definitely. I, I hope it's clear to everybody that this is not uh, traditional investing. This is clearly cross, crossed into the realm of speculation. And uh, but sometimes speculation can be very rewarding, also. Well, it all depends very on cool. what gets your rockets going. 
There Sorry you go. About the time. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Right. And one last commercial for you. Go ahead. Oh. You're going to be talking about uh, some of this stuff I on am, Saturday actually, morning. Uh, uh, Puget Sound very nicely invited me to do a presentation for their Investor Education Day. Um, I started off with the topic of small stocks and where to find them. And then Mark did such a great presentation at Bank, and um, Doug Gerlach has had some presentations. And I thought, ah, God, why, why try and reinvent this wheel? So <clears throat> I was looking around and just researching small stocks, and I came upon something called the size effect. Mm -hmm. which was discovered in 1981 by the name of a guy, by a guy by the name of Rolf Banz, B-A-N-Z. And that kind of just took me down a rabbit hole and the Puget Sound folks have been very, um, very nice and very uh, patient with me while I developed this because I don't think it's something that anybody else has ever talked about. But um, the name of the topic, actually, it's been through several iterations. That's one of the previous ones down at the bottom. It's now the size effect, uh, how uh, small company stocks came to be integrated in a, in a um, fully diversified portfolio Cool is the name of the presentation. Mm -hmm. I hope it's of interest, and I hope you all will come to the Puget Sound Investor Education Day um, next week. Virtually. So, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Or, yeah. or you can fly in one of the in on one of the Jobies. All right, I'm not yeah. going to go. Uh, thanks again, Betsy. Great stuff. All right, I'm not going to go through this in any great t detail, other than to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. The last over the last week, Investors Business Daily has run a special where you could access it for free. Unfortunately, they shut that off. If you want to take a look at some of the stuff we're about to show you, you could actually get a two-month subscription for only $12. I think that special is still running. But what we have done is put together a listing of companies that have appeared since last Halloween onto this dashboard. So, Ken, strapping ourselves in, here is a look at the IBD New America companies that have been presented on virtually a weekly basis since last October, last Halloween. And uh, we're basically going to go through and make sure all of these are up to date and uh, uh, eligible for best small company consideration. So you'll see some of these are bigger companies and they'll, they'll fall by the wayside. Uh, Lilly, for example, is on this list. And then here's the, the rest of them. So we basically have a bunch of uh, weekly features we can take a look at and dig into looking for companies that capture our attention. So this dashboard will be updated probably later today or tomorrow uh, to include all the companies, even the uncovered ones. These are the uncovered ones. And they've come up in a couple of conversations here lately. But just real quickly, here are some of the companies. We're just gonna go through these, spending a few seconds on each page. And again, you can look to the right, you can see early stage but you can see the formation of a sales trajectory for ADMA Biologics. Second set of companies, DoorDash was re recently featured by The Motley Fool, Fresh Pet has come up in a few conversations. Just some interesting companies here. Here's that on, on, O-N-O-N, -O -N, that has come up in a few conversations. Here's a quick look. Crystal Biotech looked a little bit compelling. That might actually do a little bit better than we might have considered. But again, you can see that going back week by week through these, uh, United Therapeutics is a company that has been in discussions over the last few years. You can see it has a track record. Ken is feeling more comfortable with the fact that there's actually a track record <laughs> on one of these companies. Uh, here is uh, some other interesting companies, RX Site. Alchemy actually looked fairly decent on the first Round, I want to understand the ba banking connotation and linkage, but this one also looked pretty good. I didn't include a picture of it, but Oscar Health is one that you might want to just kind of at least run across the coals, run them all across the coals. But uh, Astera Labs, again, same type of pattern, showing a business that is being established. Again, keep in mind that these are not tested by a correction or a recession. And uh, that, that's a big part of small company investing. Other companies, including Palantir, Confluent, which I don't know much about. And then uh, here's one, GigaCloud, kind of an interesting picture, a little bit more track record, ticker symbol GCT. 
for Gig Giga Cloud. And again, like yeah, I said, BR, go ahead. BRBR, which was on the preceding page at the bottom, is involved in one of our club's industry studies uh, this coming month. So uh, that's that's one's going to have a, a fairly decent looking SSG attached to it, Mark. Okay, it's BRBR. In that BRBR way. is the ticker for it, right? Uh huh. I'm pretty sure we're covering it. Um, and that's pretty much it, I think. We saw, well, Snowflake, Elf is, is not a stranger to many people here. And here's Arm, a company that has come up a number of times in the semiconductor surge. Mercado Libre, CRISPR. Again, we're going to be going down all of these and taking and, a closer look. And, Mark, we've been talking about AVAV for uh, 10 or 12 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we when we first discovered AVAV, it was uh, one of the few drone producers that you could point to and say, here's what they're doing. And that was before they were being used uh, the way they're being used today. Uh, so AVAV is an interesting company to take a look at. I, I haven't looked at it in a couple of years, in fact. Yeah, and we discovered that the charging stations near our home were actually AVAV at the time. I think they may have exited that business, but... Well, that was what brought us to the stock in the first place was the charging stations, yeah. Mm -hmm. Datadog mentioned here. So, again, a pr pretty interesting list. And like I said, you can subscribe for 12 bucks for two months. I may make this an annual tradition. I can't. Uh... And, we're, and, and the wolves are patiently waiting for Mercado Libre to get into the buy zone so we can buy it. It's on our pounce list. Mm -hmm. We really, really, really like that stock and the, the analysis that goes with it. So we will make sure that all of the companies that show up on this dashboard are current and updated. And uh, we'll have some fun with that, probably checking in on it for a brief moment next week. So good, clean, fun. The Buttonwood portfolio is here in the deck if you want to take a look. Uh, again, Schlumberger, Green Brick, and Western Alliance is bringing a smile to the faces of Ken and Matt. And yes, Kevin, I'm still a shareholder through this entire meeting. That's now at 92 is what I'm hearing from the advocates out there. We do keep all of these, archiving all of these sessions on YouTube under the Manifest Investing channel, bull sessions and roundtables. You can find them there. If you subscribe, we'll let you know when new content is added. Um, some other stuff that we're going to be looking, taking a closer look at. I, I'm not so sure about this one yet, Ken, but I thought maybe it might be interesting to discuss in November, December, some of those podcasts, I've, uh, I listened to about half of them. And with that, let's go ahead and close down. This picture, these pictures were provided by George Mack from Houston. And uh, he found Groundhog Hill. Going, he was actually driving north of North Carolina, I believe. So he gave that. And then we can't go home without a tribute to Betsy and Rockets. <laughs> And uh, if you missed it, this was pretty phenomenal. It happened over the weekend. They brought a rocket down and they caught it. It was it was absolutely amazing to watch that happen, Mark. I'll tell you. You know, you know what they call those things? No. Chopsticks. Things, chopsticks. Chopsticks. I, yep. I, I can't even make chopsticks work at the dinner table. I can't imagine <laughs> catching a rocket with chopsticks, but... This well, was this is a it, go the ahead. other amazing thing. Sorry to interrupt. But the other no. amazing thing was that this was their heavy. This is their heavy rocket. This is right. the the Falcon rocket that they've been up and back and up and back that you see launching almost like a you know like it was sci-fi or something that lands back where it started. Right. This was the I, actual heavy rocket that. You know, I think it's useful to say it's the largest rocket in the world. I think we need to take a little bit of pride in some of this technology sometimes, <laughs> you know? Musk is amazing. I learned a long time ago not to put anything. You know that I looked at Tesla in 2012 when it was $25. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't buy it. <laughs> yeah, we have we have done a number of sessions here, Betsy, on on Tesla and the fact that it's not just a car company and – Obviously, the, there's a whole lot going on that uh, probably merits our attention. All right. So with that, Ken, anything else in the hopper for today? We did run a couple minutes over, but not too bad. I'll, 
once again, thank you so much, Betsy, for for rattling the cage and continuing the early stage uh, discussions. We do think that amongst our 20 best small companies for this year, that there there is room for a few uh, speculative companies. Am, am, I, am I stretching, Ken, or are you okay with that? Or <laughs> I uh, I'm okay with them. It's anything you want to do, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> you know we're going to get there no matter what. We got to have some uh, yep, yep. interesting companies. I mean, if you can bring we, you and Mac can bring Luminar, we can do anything. We have a, a great quote to close on from Nick in the audience. He says, "As Charlie Munger said about Elon Musk, never underestimate a man who overestimates himself." Okay? <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent, good stuff. All right, thanks again, Betsy. And good luck, break well, a leg this you weekend. For having me. It's your Puget conference. Thank you. Good night, all.